explain non-locality for a moment? Non-locality came out of quantum theory um, and uh, basically um, is tied together to entanglement um, in a famous thought experiment that eventually was put to test called the EPR, einstein podolsky rosen experiment. Um, and that's one type of non-locality because there are others. Basically, you have uh, two particles that are preparing a particular quantum state, they're entangled, and they move apart. And when you make a measurement, because according to quantum theory, the properties of one particle or the, or the two particles or the system particles don't take actual values until an observation is made, uh, takes place. So one is flying apart, you make a measurement here, let's say now you pick a particular direction of a vector, let's say, or spin of a particle, okay? Immediately, and now we know it's actually immediately, the other particle assumes a complementary value. That's no locality, because it can happen at speeds, essentially it happens at infinite speeds. The two particles are always connected. So um, am I asking a question of a particular behavior of nature or cosmos here determines the answer there? I tickle the universe here and laughs there as well. Well, instantly. that would be a poetic way to put it. In the quantum, in the quantum, in the quantum uh, reality, it actually has to do with physical properties that are measured um, here, and immediately the other particle reacts. But it seems now, and this is what's, what I was saying with these complementarity principles, that what applies at the quantum realm, we believe, are generalized principles that apply at all levels. And per perhaps what we have in the brain is quantum processes at certain level, but then quantum-like, properties that appear as quantum. There's certain non-locality, non but it's not the EPR non-locality. There's global um, synchronicity in the brain, for example. So those principles seem to apply, perhaps, at every level. And it is these principles that, in my mind, is perhaps the way to approach consciousness in a scientific sense, because we're not making much progress other, otherwise. If we try to build it from bottom up, in a reductionist approach, it just doesn't work. So perhaps the principles that you mentioned, mathematical things that are applying at every level, which manifest at the quantum level, at the biological level, at the psychological level, and perhaps at the cosmic level. So you just said mathematical level. Where is mathematics? Mathemat Where does mathematics exist? Does it exist in the cosmos, or does it um, exist in the mathematician's mind? Plato. Plato would say that exists in a sphere of, um, of pure um, ideas. Uh, in a modern sense, um, if there is a transcendence to mathematics, and I believe actually there is a transcendence to mathematics, I think Einstein also believed that, um, that there is a mathematical reality, but in order for it to manifest, it manifests through our minds. So it is really the conscious awareness of human beings that creates the mathematics that then we use it as a language for the universe, to understand the universe. You know, Stuart Hameroff and um, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, in their particular mm -hmm. way of expressing it, talk about Planck scale space-time geometry, uh, which is 25 orders smaller in order of magnitude than an atom. Right. And uh, I think Stuart is here, and maybe he can correct me, but uh, according to him and Penrose, at this level, um, everything in a sense disappears. The, there's no space time, no energy, right. no matter. Uh, there are only possibilities, and they're all, uh, in their language, quantum entangled. They exist. The raw materials of the universe, such as spin, charge, gravity, whatever, they exist as possibility, and they're all. Uh, quantum ent entangled, but according to them, this is the level of platonic truth and uh, uh, mathematical truth, and uh, the evolutionary impulse of, um, of truth, goodness, beauty, harmony that we call the universe. Would you uh, be sympathetic to that idea? I would be sympathetic up to a certain point, because the, what the platonic ideas that I believe we're talking about are beyond space and time. And and it is true that when you get to the Planck level, you are reaching the end of space-time. But our mind always says, well, what is beyond the Planck level? What is beyond space-time? So perhaps there is a transcendence level that even space-time descriptions 
don't do it any good, don't do it any justice. And these perhaps are states, as you describe them in your various books, yogic states where we have awareness, but at some point without objects of awareness. And these are deep states that seem to exist. They have to do with brain activity. We can study them. They, they are very real, but there's no objectified reality in the sense that we, we perceive it with our eyes open. So would you say that uh, consciousness is non-local and local at the same time? Consciousness is non-local and local at the same time. Absolutely correct. Uh, the cosmic consciousness, that I think, um, Nancy was referring to is um, the cosmic view of the universe, and that's certainly non-local, but it be takes a part particular localized aspect through our brains. And if our brains, as Rudy was telling us, gets through some sort of uh, ill situation or because of Alzheimer's or whatever, then the hardware begins to break down. And when the hardware breaks down, then if I can be simplistic, the software doesn't work anymore. So we need the hardware to have it work in a human body with human awareness. But it seems to be a certain level of reality, you mentioned at the very beginning, the reality that operates beyond the brain. And those are experienced in different le levels of meditation, different deep sleep or whatever. Deep sleep is different, of course, than the meditative state that uh, uh, you're talking about. And then the, the dream state, the REM state is also different, the awakened state is different. So these are different levels of awareness, but they are all part of us. And we seem to be focusing on this particular awareness with open eyes. And that is just as a particular slash through space-time, through reality. For us to say that we capture everything through that, I think it's at least presumptions on our part. So, you know, uh, this question is going to come up uh, again, and we have Professor Ramachandran here as well for a later discussion. I don't know if he's in the audience right now, but uh, uh, the question does come up that what we experience yeah. in every moment of our life is either form or color or taste or smell or uh, warmth or coolness or heaviness, right. dense and texture. These the qualia, the qualia. Qualia. Yeah. That we experience qualia. Right. And yet we try to quantify them in measurements. And that's what you're doing. You know, your quantum is a unit of measurement, right? right? But the measurement is also in consciousness, isn't it? Measurements and consciousness, and, and of course the qualia that you mentioned, are the qualitative aspects of consciousness. And then we have the quantitative. Now, the problem for the last three centuries, so 300 years or so, is that because of the great success of dynamical theory, particularly Newtonian theory and then quantum theory, we have come about to try to understand the universe as just a dynamical system. And that is one big aspect of the universe. But then there is the information part of the universe. And the information is not contained in the dynamics. And therefore, we have to always be careful because that, what you could term the reality, is much bigger than we imagine. And our science, the way I view it, I also believe that it will evolve, but it will have to have a dialogue with spirituality. If, we don't, if that dialogue doesn't occur, the world is in deep trouble. Both Nancy and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Joel, and to some extent uh, uh, Rudy, we, in a sense, addressed different scales of reality, yes. right? So when you describe the macroscop macroscopic scale, you use classical laws to describe it. Pretty much. Uh, pretty much. You Even general relativity can be considered as classical to a certain extent. classical. You go to the quantum level, you have different. So are there different laws for different scales? Um, well, we believe that the constants of nature, for example, are the same. They apply everywhere. So there is a deep underlying physical constancy. Now, maybe the the constants of nature themselves are changing, that's another story. But there is a certain basic foundation of the physical universe that operates at different scales. But it seems that the way we observe it, 
you know, this is not really solid when you get down to nanoscale. And eventually, when you get to the string level, it's just a bunch of strings flying around, if, if superstring theory is correct. So in that sense, the laws of physics that we view at this level don't apply at these other levels. Could this level, this material level, be just a gestalt of qualia and consciousness? A um, conglomeration of qualia? Conglomerate. Can you explain that a bit more? And then... Well, a qualia is a unit of, yeah. um, of awareness, just like a quantum is a unit of mass or energy, right? Energy, yeah. Correct? Yeah. We think in terms of quanta when we describe, say, quantum physics. Right. But we don't experience quanta, we experience qualia. We only experience qualia. We only <laughs> experience qualia. Right. So perhaps we should reverse our whole kind of model trying to explain qualia in terms of physical chemical reactions and say, in fact, even the physical, where do you experience the brain on a CAT scan or when you look at a neural network or your own body or your thoughts? Where are these experiences? And aren't they in the end all qualia? They're sensations or images or thoughts or feelings. That's they, all we experience, right? They are. That's all we experience. So your body is a sensation in consciousness. It is a sensation in uh, consciousness. Interpreted um, as this material thing. And in fact, the things that really are dear and close to our hearts are these qualitative aspects. Art, right? Love, understanding, all these things. Uh, very few of us, I mean, I get great pleasure by solving partial differential equations, right? But in fact, those partial differential equations, they don't really by themselves mean very much. It is through them that we understand perhaps how the laws of physics of, of a star circling a black hole operates that bec becomes exciting, but it is excitement. And I think all the great scientists always point to that excitement that exists in science. So it is, it is a quality.